Two days of, uh, uh, I, I know the last two days you had a lot of information uh, exchange from the experts. And uh, today we have, uh, we are going to talk about um, the, implementation of a nuclear power program and a long-term commitment. That's the overall objective of today. And uh, we have uh, two experts from IAEA. My colleagues from IAEA are here. Uh, Ms. Amparo, she's uh, uh, working for the, the spent fuel management in the nuclear fuel cycle and materials section. She's an expert on uh, uh, the, the, the base management and the nuclear fuel cycle uh, areas. And she, she would be giving you two presentations on these uh, two topics. And she has uh, a doctorate in, uh, in the chemistry. And she also worked in the Spanish nuclear laboratory for over two decades uh, and has a lot of experience in the waste characterization and other things. Maybe she would uh, uh, introduce herself in more detail as she goes through her presentation. Also, today's uh, uh, chair, who is going to chair the, the, the entire session, Mr. Sean Dunlop, she works for the Nuclear Infrastructure Development Section. Uh, she is, uh, I mean, he is from uh, the United States, and uh, he works for the IAEA. And he has uh, previously worked in the U.S. Department of Energy. And he does a lot of coordination with the IAEA member state countries, particularly on embarking countries to develop nuclear power infrastructure in their countries. So uh, you will be having uh, very interesting sessions with uh, Sean in the afternoon. The morning sessions will be from Amparo. So I will hand over to Sean to take over the today's proceedings. Sean, please. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. I look forward to getting to know you a little bit better over the next couple of days. And without further ado, I think I'll hand things over to Amparo. So good morning. I'm Amparo Gonzalez Espartero. Um, I'm the technical lead of spent fuel management in the nuclear fuel cycle and material section in the INC. And I joined the INC in 2000, 2015. And I was working previously for 24 years in the Spanish nuclear lab, national lab, who, which supports Enresa, who is the organization in charge of the radioactive waste management in Spain, and also our regulatory body. So as, so should I, okay. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> so as Ashok said, I was asked to give a presentation, an overview of the nuclear fuel cycle. And uh, then second lecture I'm going to give is about radioactive waste management and the commissioning. So my th this presentation, I will try to give you an overview of the main stages of the nuclear fuel cycle. And we can talk about, since we are going to talk about radioactive waste after, the related waste produced in every stage. So I think that we can give, we can let the questions for the, the end of the presentation. So because sometimes I'm going to address some issues in the course of the lecture. So the nuclear fuel cycle are the main the industrial stages involved in the nu nuclear electricity product in the electric electricity production from nuclear power, and it starts by the exploration of uranium mining and milling, and ends with the eventual disposal of the wastes produced. The nuclear fuel cycle terminology. 
there are the, the stages uh, covering mining, milling, the conversion of the uranium to put it in the right uh, form to be used as fuel, the enrichment for different types of reactors of uranium, and the fuel fabrication are called the front end of the fuel cycle. And then after the electricity production, I don't know if I have a list. Ah, yeah. The fuel has to be discharged from the core after more or less three years uh, in the core of the reactor and has to be stored or reprocessed to recycling uranium and plutonium, but producing a high level waste stream that has to be managed at the, uh, uh, as the same with the same criteria as the spent fuel and has to be disposed in the um, deep geological repository. And these stages are called the back end of the fuel cycle. There are different options for the fuel cycles and so far there are two options commercially available. One is the fuel cycle which consider the spent fuel as a waste so after a period of storage, has to be disposed in the geological repository. And the second option is the so-called closed fuel cycle or one through cycle, and is the mono recycling of plutonium. So, so far, the spent fuel after a period of storage is reprocessed to recover uranium and plutonium producing MOX fuel that uh, it's burned in reactors, but only one time. So once it's discharged from the reactor, it's stored, the MOX fuel is stored for further use, and so far it's stored to be used in fast reactors. So France is the main country producing irradiated MOX fuel. And in this case, it's produced a high-level waste stream that uh, has it's vitrified, uh, are vitrified and then has to be stored also in the deep geological repository. So there are the two main fuel cycle options. So if we start step by step, let's talk by uh, mining and milling. So it depends on where the ore body is. There are three options for to get uranium from the earth. One is the open pit, underground, or in situ leach. And also there is another option that consists to recover uranium from uh, natural rocks as the fertilizers, and it's called byproduct recovery. So when the ore body is close to the surface, the open pit is the mining option. And in this case, it's produced a huge amount of barren rock. And because the pit has to be big enough, more bigger than the ore, because it's mined in a slope to prevent collapse. So as you can see, there is a lot of uh, surface disturbance in this type of mining. So the rock produced, the, bar the barren rock has to be put under water to prevent the natural radiation because you know the uranium is everywhere and the radon, the emissions of radon are very common and to, pre to prevent these em emissions, the barren rock is put under water. And these tails are used after the mining lifetime and at the time of the commissioning and this is the example of uh, one of the Spanish mine in Andujar. So it was during the remediation and the commissioning, so the barren rock was used to fill the pit. And then this is the final situation of the mining, and it was um, remediated the surface. The second option is the underground and is used when the ore body is underground and deep uh, under the surface of the earth. So in this case, it's needed to build tunnels and the disturbance in the, super, in the surface is much less. 
So much smaller waste rock is produced with a less environmental impact. And in this case, ventilation is required for workers to be protected against the airborne radiation. And the third uh, option is in situ leach. So in this case, the ore body remains where it is. So this is the a picture of the surface. And so the ore body has to be permeable to solution because the uranium is dissolved use leach using acid or alkaline solutions. And then the liquid is pumped up to be recovered. In this case, this uh, leach solution, the uranium is recovered from the leach solution by solvent solvent extraction or ion exchange. And, um, and then is um, purified and obtain the uranium oxide. So in this case, the most important thing is to prevent, not contaminate the groundwater away from the ore body situation. And if it's done well, has less environmental impact. And uranium also can be recovered from phosphate rocks. And so far, 20,000 tons of uranium has already been obtained from phosphate rocks. In this case, there are two benefits. One, in one hand, we recover uranium, but in the other hand, we reduce the amount of norm wastes in the, in the phosphate productions. I don't know if you heard about it, but uh, when, you, when phosphates are produced, it creates a stockpile of natural, its norm is natural occurrence radioactive material. And it's a big problem because uh, they are natural. This uranium is, uh, is in the earth, but it has to be um, controlled under the radioactive uh, requirements. So if we recover uranium from these deposits, um, it's a benefit from these areas that re um, produce phosphates for f fertilizers. This is the map showing the distribution of resources uh, so far of uranium. So there are 30 countries that represent approximately the 96% of the total uranium resources. And the main sources are in Australia, and second in Kazakhstan, and in the Russian Federation and Canada. So once uranium is explored, the sources and also mine, close to every mine there is a milling where the rock obtained is crushed and ground. And uranium is leaching using acid solution because the content of uranium in the rock is very low, it's around 0.1%. So once we get the solution, Uranium is obtained, well, first of all, we have to separate the barren rock from the liquid by filtration. And after the solution is purified and concentrate, getting U308. That is the way that uranium is packed and dispatched. And this is the so-called yellow cake. So the yellow cake can be yellow, it's yellow, but when it's calcined, it's... Um, Greenish, dark, very dark. So this this is the way that uranium is dispatched and contains the eighty contains around eighty five percent of uranium and is packed in two hundred twenty liters drums and it ships to the conversion plant. Why? Because in this form, uranium um, is not suitable to be used in the reactors. So in the conversion plant, the U308 is converted to uranium dioxide. And in this case, can be used by the reactors that use natural uranium, that's the can-do reactors of the uh, heavy water pressurized reactors. And in the case of those reactors, light water reactors, we need to use uranium um, enriched 
Uranium uh, yellow cake is uh, transformed in hexafluoride uranium, which is the only gaseous uh, compound of uranium because so far all enrichment process work in um, gaseous phase. So let's go to the enrichment step. So why we have to enrich? Because the natural uranium-5 concentration in uranium the isotope composition is 0.71% of uranium-5. And most of the reactors, like water reactors, work with 4%, 5% of uranium-5. So the concentration of uranium-5 in the uranium has to be increased. And how we can do that? Because it's very difficult to work with isotopes of the same element. They have the same chemical properties. So there are so far some se several enrichment processes demonstrated, but only two are commercially available. Both explode the difference of uh, mass between the isotope 5 and 8. And there are large commercial enrichment plants in countries such as France, Germany, Netherlands, UK, United States, and Russian Federation. And China is uh, so is now is currently increasing their capacity as their own demand is increasing. So during the enrichment, we will see that we will get two streams. One stream is the call, is the so-called low enriched uranium, which will be four or five percent enriched, and the other streams is called depleted uranium or tails. So it's the uranium stream containing Low, less than 0.7% of uranium-5. So the two options is the gaseous diffusion. It was the first uh, method used. And in this case, the hexafluoride of uranium is forced to go through a membrane to a high pressure. And then physically, the lighter atoms pass through the pores of the membrane. Um, meanwhile, the, heavy, the heaviest one remain in the lower part. So this process is repeated, repeated many, many times. So to get around 4% of uh, uranium-5, it has to be repeated around 1,400 times. So this process is very, very energetic, cons uh, consumes a lot of energy. And the energy that it's consumed during the process is measured um, in these separative working units. We will see what does it mean. And it consumes around 2,400 kilowatts per hour per zoom. So the, there are all facilities dedicated to gaseous diffusion are going to be dismantling and stop when they reach their lifetime. Their lifetime. And now the more used um, method is the centrifuge process that consists in tubes, vacuum tubes, with a rotor that speeds a very high speeds around 50,000 to 70,000 RPM. And in this case, the heaviest uh, atoms are moved to the surface, to the walls of the cylinder, and the lighter remains in the middle. So repeating the process several times, we get the separation and the the, of the, to increase the concentration of uranium-5 in the final product. And in this case, you can see this process consumes much less energy, so 50 kilowatts per hour per zoom. So now is the, the, the most um, used process. And has to be done in cascade. That means that there are many, many tubes in series. And then if we repeat the process several times, we get at the end the rich uranium and the depleted stream. So what means zoom? The separative work unit is a very complex unit that indicates the energy input that it's needed relative to the amount of uranium processed. The degree 
of enrichment and the degree of depletion in the tails and can be referred to a kilogram su or simply su. And for example, this is um, the evolution of uh, su depending on the enrichment. And it depends also on the depletion of the tails and, uh, and the enrichment. So we can play if it works, Let's see. For example, if we refer, okay, so we can refer to one ton of product, and we can put here how much we would like. So, if we use the fetusai is the natural uranium, and we would like to get four percent, for example, of enrichment. <coughs> And we would like to have a tail of 0.3 or, let's see, 0.2 of, of uranium-5 in the depleted stream. If we calculate, then we get 4,424 sum. Let's see. Kilo sum. Per kilograms of per ton of uranium enriched. So we have a ton of uranium at uh, we said at four percent with a tail of uranium depleted uranium we said 0.4. But for the same tone of uranium, to 35, 4%. And we, we need to feed a system with seven tons of natural uranium, 7.5. But what's happened if we would like to have a more depleted tail? And if we keep the 4%, we keep everything, and then we will consume more energy, so 6 kilosu, for the same uranium ton with a more depleted tail, so we will consume 6.38 tons of Uranium. So we will need less feed, less amount of uranium, nat natural uranium, but we consume more energy. So we can play during the enrichment with the tails and with the energy consumption. So let me check if I can go back. So once we have the uranium enriched at the amount necessary to be used in the light water reactors, we go to the fuel fabrication. And the fuel fabrication is a very, very specific process because you know the first barrier is the, the pellet itself. So once we have uranium, uh, natural uranium or enriched uranium, we have to make the pellets, by the ceramic pellets, by a process called sintering at high temperature, around 900 degrees. And this process uh, has to meet a very tight quality assurance specific specifics. So the size of pellets is one centimeter per more or less one centimeter. And these pellets are placed in tubes that call um, rods that could be stainless steel or silk alloy. This is an alloy made by zirconium. And the rods with containing the pellets has to be placed 
in a very um, robust structures that are called bundles or fuel assemblies. And these structures has to be physical, uh, very robust to be able to support the high operating temperatures in the core of the reactor and also the intense flux of neutron radiation. So these structures, this is a fuel assembly, has to be resistant against the chemical corrosion because the water is in the core of the reactor, the high temperatures, and also the static loads and the vibrations, and the fluid and mechanical impacts, not only in the core of the reactor, but also during the storage and all the handling steps that the fuel assemblies uh, has to, to, to undergo. There are different um, types of fuel assemblies depending on the type of the reactor. So the Kandu reactors or the pressurized heavy water reactors works with these um, 36 rods assemblies in Circaloy. And the PWR is the biggest uh, fuel assemblies with 17 for, uh, 70 versus 17 pins in circaloy. The uh, BWR 9 plus 9 is the smallest one. And also the Russian uh, fuel assemblies, the Russian version of the PWR is the BBR, is uh, use uh, 312 uh, rods in circaloy. And the advanced gas reactors use the pins, and the pins are covered by graphite. And we will see when we will talk about radioactive waste and the commissioning that this graphite is an issue today because the irradiated graphite is very difficult to manage. And we will see what's happening during the decommissioning. And also, this is the assembly, the fuel assembly for the fast reactor, the sodium fast reactors. Sorry. Sorry. The rods, yes, the number of the the number of rods. Yes. This is square. It's four meters tall and it's uh, I don't know what is the size, but it's 17, 17 rods and seven, 17 rods. So once the, we have the fuel assemblies placed in the core and the, electri the electricity production uh, in the, oh sorry, in the reactor, uranium-5 is uh, fission and also Uranium-8 um, is fertile material, so uranium-8, it, it, it doesn't go under fission, but can capture a neutron, and it became to be plutonium-39, and plutonium-39 is fissionable. So plutonium-39 also contributes to the energy production in one-third. So once the fuel it's in the core, stays in the core for around three years, more or less. It begins to be, it doesn't meet the safety requirements so far, so because the neutron, it became to be more absorbed neutrons, and also the, the metallic parts can be uh, embrittled. So, it's decided to consider the spent fuel, the fuel spent after three years in the core, and the composition of the fuel has changed from 95% of uranium-8 to around 92, and from 5% of uranium-5 to 1% of uranium-5 remaining, and also we have now a new element that is plutonium in a concentration of about 1%, we have fission products and around a compensation of 5%, and also the so-called minor actinides that are the actinides 
that are not uranium and plutonium, so Neptunium, Americium, Curium, Californium, Becquerelium, and they are called minor actinides because they are in a very lower concentration compared to uranium and plutonium. So once the spent fuel is the fuel is considered spent, it should be it has to be stored under water due to its characteristics because it's very the heat production, the decay heat, and because the water serves as biological shielding. So the pools are located in the reactor building and the fuel assemblies are placed in racks that uh, has uh, materials that absorb neutron to avoid criticality. So depending on the um, strategy to manage spent fuel, the spent fuel can be stored in the pools for, from decades or months. And the water not only provides shielding, but also allows visual inspection of the fuel assemblies. And the chemistry of the water has to be strictly controlled. Uh, so, for example, the routine controls are to the measure of the pH, the boron levers, because the boron is used by ne as a neutron absorber, the conductivity, because the conductivity gives us the idea of the ions present in the water, and also the gross alpha, beta, and gamma activity, because it indicates if there is release of radioactivity from the fuel assembly, that means that there are pinholes in the roads. And give an idea, uh, so a leakage of radioactivity. So there are different options and techniques to store the spent fuel and goes from wet at reactor or away from reactor and also dry options. Once um, the spent fuel is spent time in water, we can, um, there are options to move the spent fuel to dry storage. So let's see, these are the options to store spent fuel. So it could be at reactor storage for a long period of time and then go to the final disposition. Or can be in the at reactor storage facility in pool, and then the interim storage, usually in dry, could be on site, and then to go to the final disposition. There are other options that after a period at reactor, it, the spent fuel it moves to an interim storage away from reactor, sometimes uh, hundreds of kilometers far away before the final disposition, or could be a store at reactor and then to be moved to an interim storage on site and then to be moved to an interim storage off site and then go to final disposition. So these are the different options so far for to a storage spent fuel. How many years of Oh there is no definition of uh, interim storage so far is considered sixty years, around sixty and now it's considered longer because only few countries have uh, facing in a short term the final disposition. So many countries uh, need um, a period of around 100 years to have a final disposition ready. So interim storage now, the facilities are licensed for 60 years more or less. So on site, you mean on site or away? Yes. Ah, on site. On site, it depends on first the, the lifetime. In principle, is the lifetime of the nuclear power because it, on site is in the pool of the reactor, and it's around 40 years. And now is the license period of the lifetime of the nuclear power. And we will see uh, some examples of nuclear powers in the United States, for example that uh, after the nuclear power plant has been shut down, the, um, the pools has to be emptied, and the spent fuel was moved to an interim storage on site. 
dry storage and we will see a picture of a power plant completely dismantled and the dry storage remain on site. So it happened now in the United States. And it's a, it's a problem because at the end, the country has different interim storage spread around the country. So it's an issue. Sorry? In the, in the world? It's a war. Uh, we will see <laughs> at the end of the presentation what is the status. So, what is the current situation of storage in the world? So, every year, it's around 7,000 tons of heavy metal discharged from reactors that goes, undergoes to storage from the 447 nuclear power plants in operation in 30 countries. So at the end of 2016, there were 270,000 tons of heavy metal in the storage, and the majority are on site at reactors, the 80%. And but uh, what's happened now, most of the nuclear power plants are reaching the end of the lifetime and most of the pools are full. So the nuclear power plants need to, to find a solution and some countries have decided to start dry storage on site. Oh, sorry. So there are so far 151 away from reactor storage facilities and this name is a little bit confusing because um, if, we, if we speak properly, at reactor means in the building of the reactor. That's what I mean at reactor. So the pool is at reactor building. And away from reactor also mean on site, but not in the same building. And also mean away from reactor far away. So away from reactor means could be on site and could be outside, outside the, containment. the containment. But could be on site and also 100 kilometers far away. Yeah, so, so the, the new storage facilities, uh, that doesn't mean the pool under, uh, inside the containment uh, building. Um, so now, so far, we have 151 away from reactor storage facilities in 27 countries. And 80% of these facilities are dry storage. And most of them have been deployed for more than 25 years. So some member states, such as Canada, United States, have more than 30% of the total spent fuel inventory in dry storage. So there are, I think you have received a lot of information about safety standards and all this, the storage facilities and storage uh, activities has to meet the requirements, safety requirements. And there are two specific safety guides. One is uh, uh, safety guide uh, WSG 6.1, it's a storage of radioactive waste. And the other is the specific safety guide 15, uh, as its main, and it's referred to the storage of spent nuclear fuel. And the main, the overall objective of safety is to protect people, environment, from the harmful effects of the radiation. And the storage systems has to meet the safety functions. So they have to, uh, give appropriate containment of the radioactive material. And the first barrier is the pellet. The second barrier is the fuel assemblies. And then there is the, also the canister and the casks to, to, to keep the radioactive under control. So the system has to be critical safety against criticality. So it can be, never occur that uh, it lets in a configuration that can be critical. It 
has to have effective heat, decay heat removal. And in the case of uh, pool, the water is the coolant. And in the case of dry, is the natural convention, convection. And it also um, um, has to ensure that uh, those um, for workers and also for the public remains under the limits and also has to ensure that uh, the variability of the spent fuel to undergo to the next steps of uh, the spent fuel management. So we have talked about uh, to store the spent fuel and the water. So the pool storage is a mature technology since it's been used from the beginning of the nuclear power generation. And so they accumulated more than 50 years of operating experience. And as we said, the chemistry of the water has to be strictly controlled to ensure the minimum concentration of radionuclides in the water, to keep the clarity for uh, inspection and to minimize the corrosion of the metal surfaces, the rods and the fuel assemblies. So the benefits of water is because uh, the water uh, gives um, is the coolant efficiency and shielding, it's a bi biological shielding. And the main issue is the water always um, provoke corrosion. So we have to keep the water under strict conditions to prevent the corrosion of the metal parts. And this is the CLAP concept in Sweden because they decided to storage the interim storage of spent fuel underwater. And it's away from the reactor. And instead of using dry storage, they use water storage. And, sorry. Of course, because um, the water, if you put something in water, it's corroded. So um, you, you have to, it's de first of all, it's deionized water, because the presence of different ions can provoke corrosion, chlorine, for example, and the ions we have in the normal water. So first, the whole pool is full by deionized water to prevent the corrosion. And also, um, you can control. Uh, um, it's very if you see um, under control um, still water, or you have bacteria, bacteria very easily. So you cannot see, and it's not clear the water. So you cannot see. You cannot inspect visually what is um, the status of the fuel assemblies. So the bacteria and also the bacteria corrodes everything. And um, so in one hand, you have to prevent corrosion. It's the most important thing. And you have to also to prevent the levels of boron to, for criticality controls for neutron absorbers. Yeah, the, the fuel assemblies is directed, you can see, I think it's, it's better seen in the other picture. Here. You can see, this is the fuel assemblies. Only puts it in, um, how you call it, uh, in racks. 
So it's not without any containment. So there's a rack and the, the fuel assembly is put like this, directly in the water. So that's why you have to prevent all corrosions. And also it's a way to control the radioactivity in the water. So you cannot have a concentration of radioactivity in the water first for the workers, and also because it means that there is some leakage in the fuel assemblies, and you have to be careful. So, okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The corrosion rate? I don't know by heart. I can check. I don't. I don't have this information in my mind. But I can check if there is any guidelines, any limits. I will tell you. So there are a lot of projects. There is. Yeah. I, should, I don't know if there is any guidelines or um, I don't know. I have to check. So this is the, um, the dry storage options. So you see we have casks, metal casks. We have also concrete um, canisters and vaults. So the casks and the canisters are modular and also can be monolithic. And they are circular, the casks in the cross section. And the heat, the decay heat is removed by convection, a natural convection. And in the case of canisters, they can be vertical or horizontal. And the vaults are buildings that are also modular, so can be added more and more um, arise of cavities and can be above or below ground level. And also the canister can be below, above or below ground level. But in dry storage, the main, um, let's say, the main benefit of the dry storage is this is a passive system. So it doesn't need any um, systems, active systems. So the system is um, controlled by itself. And in the case of the water, of the pools, now there is a lot, after Fukushima, there, there is a lot of work um, done and performed and trying to find solutions to make the pools more passive than they were before. So the goal is to have the most passive systems for storage. So the, spin, the dry storage um, options and uh, technologies have been um, applied to the all different types of uh, spent fuels. And has, uh, the dry storage technologies have evolved since their conce conception. And uh, at the beginning, they were all only designed for uh, storage. But uh, today, they are designed uh, for storage and transportation, and they are the so-called dual-purpose casks. And the idea is to design multi-purpose systems and to be licensed for storage, transportation, and also for disposal. So the idea is not to, once the spent fuel is placed in the casks, and the cask is licensed for all the stages, is to avoid um, additional um, handling and additional uh, to open the cask to handle the spent fuel from one cask to another cask. So the idea is to simplify the process to avoid manipulate too much the fuel assemblies. 
So this is an example of a cask store, a cask design in Germany. So you can see the fuel assemblies. This is the basket for the fuel assemblies. And there are many layers outside with neutron absorbers to prevent the dose. Um, and the spent fuel inside the casks around 300 uh, Celsius degrees, more or less. And the decay heat is um, eliminated by natural convention. And there are some layers and lids to close the casks. Some are bolted and also welded. So this is the main issue now, to try to find a way to license the cask for the three stages. It's not that easy. So this is the, the main issue. Because then you, can, you don't need to retrieve the spent fuel in the, from the casks used for storage and transportation. So if it's licensed for disposal too, you can use it to be disposed. So you don't need to, to retrieve the spent fuel. That is a very, um, it's not it's difficult, but also it's a, a source of uh, damage in the, in the fuel assembly. If you have to handle after 30 years of storage or 60 years of storage, so you have the same cask license for disposal, and this is the issue, how to get the license, how to ensure that uh, a system that was licensed for storage 60 years ago is still valid to be disposed. So now we, for example, in our section, in my team, we are starting working in transportation issues for casks after a long period of storage because some of the casks, the dual proposed casks, have been licensed for storage and transportation, but uh, you, store, you store the casks in the nuclear power plant and you transport. But what's happened after 60 years of storage in the interim storage, and you have to transport these casks to the disposal facility, even to retrieve. But what's happened after 60 years? So now we are working in this type of issues. And there is an international group in safety dedicated to dual purpose systems for the license, to, to find the requirements and all the aspects and parameters to be taken into account for the license process. So, so far it's uh, when we consider, up, so, once we store the spent fuel, we can dispose the, uh, eventually dispose of the spent fuel in the um, uh, deep geological repository. But for those countries which don't consider the spent fuel as a waste, they consider the spent fuel as an asset, they reprocess the spent fuel to get the uranium and plutonium for recycling. So what is the status? So we, we, were, we, we talk about the storage, but the total amount of spent fuel discharged globally is around 400,000 tons of heavy metal so far. And one third of this amount, it has been or is under reprocessing so far. So, 1,000 tons of heavy metal is discharged every year. 7,000 tons, no, sorry, 10,000 tons are discharged. 7,000 tons are stored. And the remaining 3,000 tons, so one third, is reprocessed. The annual reprocessing capacity in the world so far is 4,600 tons of heavy metal per year. Although now it's not all is currently used now not operational. So in which consists uh, the reprocess is to, um, to get the plutonium and uranium to be used again 
as uh, MOX fuel and it's produced a high level waste that means the, the composition is mainly the fission products and the minor actinides. So, so far, France, UK, India and Russian Federation are reprocessing. Japan now is, um, it was four or five months ago, the government um, clearly said that they will continue going for closing, close cycle, and the Rokashimura is under licensing process. And China has a pilot plan, and also it's building, or it's going to build a new uh, reprocessing plan, but they are facing some, uh, built by Areva, but they are facing some stakeholder issues to, in the site, decided for, uh, to build the reprocessing plan. So by the end of 2016, around 120 kilotons of heavy metal had been reprocessed. And the major reprocessing facilities are planned to be commissioned in China, Japan, and in the Russian Federation. Since UK is going to shut down Thorpe plan and also they are going to open cycle. So they are changing the fuel cycle option and they are moving UK from closed cycle to open cycle. So this is the main process for reprocessing is the Purex process, is plutonium uranium reextraction. And after mechanical disassembly, and the rods has to be chopped and the spent fuel is dissolved in nitric acid. It's generating an off-gas stream that is treated by and is filtered and main of, uh, mainly iodine and the noble gases produced are trapped in particular trapping um, absorbers and the nitric acid, once this is dissolved, it's a stream that has to be treated. So the acid solution undergoes through solvent extraction using tributyl phosphate, and this is the molecule, in aliphatic uh, diluent as kerosene or dodecane. So under liquid-liquid extraction, Uranium and plutonium are recovered, and the rest of the fission products and minor actinides remain in the high level waste stream. So, the main of the minor actinides are in trivalent state, so that's why they are not uh, extracted by TBP, that only extract uh, uranium in the early extract uh, uh, in hexavalent and for valence state. So once uranium and plutonium are recovered uh, from the organic solution, the solvent is treated, is clean, and is reused again in order not to not produce a lot of organic spent solvent because the organic solutions are very difficult to manage as secondary wastes. So the um, the TBP in kerosene is treated and cleaned to be reused several times. So once uranium and plutonium are recovered, they are split in two streams in plutonium dioxide and the so-called repu uranium, and they are stored for um, further use. So plutonium is mixed with uh, depleted uranium or natural uranium to produce MOX fuel, and so far REPU is a store to be used uh, in the future. TBP is tributyl phosphate. It's a molecule, it's a phosphate with three butyl changed. So, you mean reprocess the fuel? 
when you send your print, if you, if you will receive the read this if you need your run. Uh -huh. And your record is defined for that. You can do it. But for most, you know, sometimes I file a record to need to verify the record. So if there are people who can read this, you have to be present. And uh, so the MOX fuel, as far as I know, the MOX fuel is produced with mixing plutonium dioxide and natural uranium or depleted uranium. If you use Repu, Repu has a um, different uranium composition because it remains 1% of uranium-5 in the Repu. And also there is uh, other isotopes of uranium. I think it's uranium-232. That is a very strong gamma emitter. So the, comp the isotopic composition of repu is different to the natural uranium or the depleted uranium. So I'm not engineering the core, so, but uh, you have to have into consideration that the isotopic composition of repu is different. So what I will receive, I don't I To reprocess? Yes, what I will receive. So it depends on the contract. Because, for example, some countries, when you sign the contract with a reprocess facility, you can receive MOX fuel, you can receive uh, only the high-level waste. So you have to receive the high-level waste because any country can get waste from other countries. So even if you send your spent fuel to reprocess, you will receive the high-level waste. Um, I think you will, it depends on the contract, but you cannot, if you would, if you don't want to receive the repu, you don't need to receive the repu. I mean, uh, which I will use as a fuel, not uh, receive the higher waste and all that, but I mean, as a fuel, which, which, is, which will I receive? Do you mix the fuel or the other one? As a fuel, as a fuel. As a fuel, you will receive MOX. You will receive MOX fuel. Because I understood that this is the Russia. They said you will never receive repu. You will never receive repu. No, MOX fuel. MOX fuel is another issue. You will receive repu, which is uranium. Okay, so you will receive. Because the core is not designed for MOX. You need to modify. Okay. So it depends on the contract you sign. If you, your core allows you to use REPU, you can receive REPU if your core allows you. For example, in the case of Spain, we send some of our spent fuel from Bandellos, for example, to France for reprocessing. And we are not allowed to use MOX in our uh, reactors, and we are not allowed to use REPU as well. So that we are going to receive is a high-level waste. but. Um, we don't have so far any storage to store high-level waste in Spain. So our waste remain in France, waiting for our country to have a suitable um, storage facility. But um, we only will receive the waste because we are obliged to receive it, but we are not going to receive any additional fuel because we are not allowed in our nuclear power plants are not licensed to use MOX fuel and repute. And this is a contract that Spain signed. So it depends on your the conditions of your license or your regulatory body and also the, your reactor design. Because, sorry, because if you cannot use plutonium, you cannot use repute, the facility, the reprocess facility can use it and can sell this material to another country, so it can be used for another country. Or using the cells. Sorry, can you? Oh, can be used as a fuel but uh, the core should be changed a little bit, and the design of the core uh, should change. And um, the problem with REPU is um, the composition of uranium after reprocessing, the isotopic composition change. And now it it's, uh, needs um, 
additional safety requirements because uh, there is the, one of the isotopes of uranium is 232, and it's a very strong gamma emitter. So, and you need a shield for the workers or to remote handling. But can be used when rich again, and can be used as a fuel. Of plutonium and repute? Ah, because the repute is the 95% of spent fuel is... Uh, yeah, so if you consider, for example, one road, and the final composition of the spent fuel is around 92% of uranium, and around 1% of plutonium, and this is, if we consider that the process is 100% efficient, we will get at the end, the plutonium is 1% in the beginning, and repu it's 92%, because the bulk of the spent fuel is uh, uranium. That changed the composition. At the beginning, the composition was 95% to uranium-8 and 5% of uranium-5. But at the end, repu changed uh, in, in the core. The composition changed from 95% of uranium-8 is now 92 because some of the uranium-8 has been consumed producing plutonium-9, and uranium-5 has been has been fissioned, so and it's consumed from 5% from the beginning to around 1% at the end. And during the fission process and the neutron capture process, there are ch also changes in the composition of uranium, and there are new isotopes produced. But if we consider that we started with a pellet, at the end we will have 1% of plutonium and 92% of repute. So since in the enrichment process there is a lot of depleted uranium produced, it's easier to use the depleted uranium or natural uranium to fabricate MOX fuel because you can handle this uranium without any shielding for, for the workers. But if you use repu, you need a facility, a modified facility, because the com isotopic composition of uranium has changed. And there are strong gamma emitters now. Emission. Uh, so even for so yesterday we talked about the restoration for the one two three uh, two two three two. Uh, by the way, uh, for thorium and uh, like this uh, thorium full cycle, you can. By the way, it's uh, from several points of view of restoration. It's good. Uh, it's very difficult to produce the gamma from the, uh, which will produce. But if you have online or online refueling, or you can remove two, three, two, uranium, two, three, two, before it goes to neutrons, so it means online, mm -hmm. you can, uh, you, you have a problem with, or challenge with the operation, mm -hmm. okay? So, uranium, as it, it's no problem for gamma emission, no problem. The problem with that, it goes to neutrons, more neutrons, in this case, you will have another element, maybe with more. Okay. Ah, okay. But I mean, it's not the same because um, for the handling of this uranium yes. in the facility. Yes. Uh, no problem. Mm -hmm. it. But the problem is you export to new Ah. So, in the spring fuel for thorium fuel cycle, you already have two, three, two in the floor, and a lot of our uh, will they will export to new plants, and in this case. Then the element, which is 
Yeah, from the preparation issues, but you yeah. can, one way to, uh, to, uh, to make something wrong, not deviation from not preparation, or you make something wrong, you mm -hmm. can uh, this, uh, extract the line to food, big food, uh -huh. which is, by the way, have this physical mass and many other. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. And you can do it. Okay, so I will give you after the talk um, reference because there is a very uh, interesting technical report dedicated to REPU. Uh, it's a nuclear energy series. So, and in this report, there is a lot of the all options for to manage REPU and to use REPU so far. So I will give you the, the reference after the talk. Um, so. The reprocessed uranium, as we talked, can be enriched again and reused in the reactor fuel. And plutonium is used uh, to produce MOX fuel, is mixed oxide fuel. So to produce MOX fuel, plutonium and depleted uranium are mixed and pelletized and loaded in the roads to fabricate new fuels. And for example, in France, most of the of the of their reactors are licensed to use MOX fuel, and certainly the fuel and the fuel assembly uh, are identical to the oxide uranium fuel. But in this case, for the fuel fabrication, it's necessary to make it under glove box due to the plutonium is uh, has uh, problems with inhalation hazard is because of, it's a very strong of. Uh, emitter, so it should be handled in locked boxes. Yes, sure. Yeah, because in this case, if you re-enrich again, because the enrichment is around 100%, if you re-enrich again, you don't need any other fissionable, you have the uranium as its fission, you uranium five. Already, but you need to enrich because yes, you're enriching. Not enough. And this is what happened. By the way, uh, according to the flood uh, what we, what we, we received, uh, we will receive the reprocess of uranium. And the design of the core is ready from the beginning for reprocess uranium. But it's not ready for Mox. Mox is ah, okay. to okay. So if you have uh, if you have and you pay and you will do the same you will receive the reprocess uranium, not the Mox. So you, ne you will never receive the plutonium yes. because you are not. Sure. Okay, yeah. But it depends on your contract. In the case, yes, I mean, I, yes, I mean, there's a difference that you need to modify your form. Mm. Yeah. So you can, yeah, if you, uh, even you need a, a license to use reprocessed uranium, for example, in our case, we don't, we cannot use it in Spain. But if you are allowed to use, you will receive the reprocessed uranium, re enrich, or you can re enrich and reuse again. And the plutonium, as I mentioned before, is mixed with depleted uranium. Because the, the fissile material is plutonium, and uran depleted uranium act as a matrix and as a fertile material. So, as a summary, we have talked about the open cycle. One of the fuel cycle options is the open cycle, so it's considered they use fuel as a waste. The one through cycle or the closed cycle is not fully closed because plutonium is used once as a MOX fuel and then is stored or is considered waste. And now for the future and for the sustainable sustainability of the nuclear energy, there is a lot of effort applied to use and to develop as a commercial scale fast neutron reactors to fully close the cycle and to reuse all the time plutonium and 
to get the equilibrium in the plutonium. So in the ideal world, it, will, it won't be necessary to have more uranium. And with plutonium, we can sustainable. And we have the stable inventory of plutonium. So it, it's reduced in a huge amount the waste produced and the burden of the waste. So this is uh, the R&D so far is dedicated to, to have this fuel cycle option. And there are countries as Russia that has the only operating fast reactor in the world is the BN-800. It was connected to the grid in 2015. And we had uh, last June the fast reactor conference there in Yekaterinburg uh, with 800 attendees and with the, all the community of fast reactor and associated field cycles. So this slide, it, it means the radio toxicity. And uh, so we can see this is a radio toxicity evolution of the open cycle. And it's due to plutonium, mainly to plutonium. If we avoid plutonium in the high level waste, the radiotoxicity decrease and is due to minor actinides. But in the case of fully use the fast reactors and the advanced fuel cycles and the fully use of uranium plutonium recycling plus the minor actinide recycling, only fission products remain in the high level waste and due to the half lives of the radionuclides of the fission products, the radiotoxicity get uh, the radiotoxicity of the uranium in around 100 years, so 300, 400 years. So compared to millions of years, is an increase in the reduction, uh, an improvement in the reduction of the burden of the radiotoxicity in the high level wastes. And this is the future that is uh, foreseen in nuclear energy technology. So let me give you some examples of the, so to apply these scenarios, we need to have, so uranium and plutonium recycling from the chemistry point of view is have been already proved uh, with Purex process, but to get minor actinides is not that easy task because the minor actinides and some of the fission products have the same chemistry. So they are trivalent elements and they are, it's not that easy to, to separate them. So there are international efforts applied to this and there are some European projects and also American projects. And we try now in the INC to coordinate all these R&D efforts in the world. So we try to set a project with the European community, with America, Japan, Korea, China. Uh, we are working on that. So for example, this is the American process, it's Urex Plus, and it's a modification of the Purex process. And the P disappeared from Purex and now it's Urex because they work not to have plutonium separated for the proliferation issues. And so we, they separate uranium, they separate plutonium, with the rest of minor actinides, basically with Neptunium. So, and they conduct the process in steps. So they separate uranium and also they separate those elements that produce heat decay and they are cesium and strontium. And for, they separate plutonium with Neptunium. The minor actinides with the lanthanides that are the main fission products and they are very difficult to separate among them. And finally, there is a process dedicated to separate minor actinides from lactanides. This is the American um, approach. The European approach is 
to separate once the bulk of uranium is separated, the plutonium is extracted um, with the rest of minor actinides, and the process is called GANEX, it's the group actinide extraction. There is another approach, and it's uh, as the American approach in steps. So it's the so-called Diamex process. It's called Diamex because it's using a diglycolamide. And it's dedicated to separate minor actinides with lanthanides from the high-level waste as the American process. And then once we have minor actinides with lanthanides, the separation between minor actinides and lanthanides is, is, um, is done with by using the SANEX process, the selective actinide extraction, using a dedicated molecule that is selective for actinides and not for lanthanides. And then there is another process it's called sesame, to separate americium and corium to produce the blankets for, the, for transmutation. So all this process has have been tested at a pilot plant scale. But none of them have been already demonstrated at a commercial scale. This is uh, the, weight, the weight methods, and also they are understudied the dry methods that consist in dissolving the spent fuel in a molten salt bath. And it's called the electrorefining process. And using the difference in electroactivity between the elements, we can get a cathode if the bulk of uranium and we can have a cathode, a liquid cathode, with the rest of the minor actinides and plutonium and with some of uranium. And this is the real liquid cathode after the separation. And this is the real uranium deposit, the cathode with the uranium deposit. And this um, process uh, have been, has been also tested at a pilot scale but it's not commercially available and in Korea they are working hard and they built um, a pilot plant to test the process called in a cold test not using radioactive material but using cold uh, simulators and to demonstrate the capability of this um, process to be at commercial scale so this is the future. And in any case, we need at the end a deep geological repository to dispose of the spent fuel or the high level waste produced um, during the reprocessing activities. So this is a picture of a deep geological repository. And so far, there are four countries in the development of the license step. So France has made a lot of effort uh, to uh, implement um, the industrialization of the industrial implementation of uh, the deep geological repository for high-level waste, and they have an underground laboratory, and it calls CGO. In, um, in the northeast part of France. Finland has submitted the license for the Deep Geological Repository, and they received in 2015 the positive feedback from the regulatory body expressed in a letter to the government. And they recommend to start the, the building of the uh, facility uh, under certain circumstances. So they are now building the deep geological repository. And also Sweden has admitted the license, is in the licensing process. And they don't have received so far the um, final um, approval by the regulatory body but um, they have some positive feedback and, and formal positive feedback 
and the unique ever submitted license uh, was in the United States in 2008 and the NRC um, and the staff, uh, the regulatory body staff uh, shows their positive feedback from for the uh, repository but uh, they found at the end some issues with the rights, the owner rights for the land and for the water that stopped the project and so it happened the change of administrative uh, administration so Obama administration decided to stop the project but not for the technical issues because the project was uh, approved by the NRC but was political and societal issues so it shows that it's very important that stakeholder involvement from the beginning in this uh, in all the nuclear development energy development stages but specifically uh, in the sites uh, for the repository that has to last for thousand years so the community has to be engaged and to be not to be asked at the end so they have to be engaged from the beginning in the project and I, so I let you some sources of information. So this is our technical areas. You can find here our projects on the on storage, spent fuel storage, and also some interesting information. And I will give you later the the reference of the review um, report. And that's it. Thank you for your attention.